Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Welcome to the second session of day three of the Exploring for the Future Showcase. My name's Laura Gow. I'm the Exploring for the Future Program Manager at Geoscience Australia, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. In today's first session, we heard about some of the program's work on the themes of geological processes and resources. We heard talks on groundwater and basin hosted base metal deposits, the Atlas of Australian mine waste and hydrogen storage. All of these have the potential to make a real difference to Australia's transition to net zero. The work we are showcasing is only possible through extensive collaboration. We sincerely thank all our collaborators for their valuable contributions. This session will highlight research into national mineral potential assessments, inventories of basins for energy resources and groundwater, and the potential for energy resources in East, Eastern Central Australia. There will be a Q&A session following the presentations. You can ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. If they can't answer your question, they'll be happy to take it on notice via our email, eftf at ga.gov.au. Our first speaker is Dr Ariane Ford, who will talk about national scale mineral potential assessments and how they can support mineral exploration in the transition to net zero. 
Ariane is a spatial data analyst who foc whose focus is on the use of spatial statistics and machine learning for evaluating mineral potential using mineral systems-based approaches. She joined Geoscience Australia in 2022 as the activity leader for mineral pr prospectivity and prediction, and previously worked extensively in both academia and industry, largely focused on mineral potential mapping studies. She holds a, a Bachelor of Science with honours in computer science and a PhD in economic geology, both from James Cook University. Thank you for that introduction. Although I'm presenting this work, it is not a solo effort and has involved the work of many geoscientists across Geoscience Australia. I would also like to acknowledge that this kind of national scale assessment includes many national scale data sets and is not possible without the collaboration and cooperation of the state and territory geological survey organisations. So we thank them for their support. As you would have heard about from Andrew Heap earlier in the showcase, the transition to net zero will require significantly increased demand for a number of key commodities required for the electrification and renewable energy technologies. Many think tanks have projected a shortfall of copper starting in around 2025, with the shortfall increasing as we move towards 2050. You can see on the graph on the right that there is up to more than seven times projected growth in the demand for rare earth elements between 2020 and 2040, and close to three times growth in demand for copper if we're to actually meet net zero globally, which are indicated by the orange bars on the graph. However, even if we only meet the demand based on what global governments have promised as of 2020, there is still over three times predicted growth in demand for rare earths and just under two times for copper, which are the blue bars on the graph. And as you can see in the quote at the bottom of the slide, the world needs to mine more copper in the next two and a half decades and has been mined in the history of mankind. So we need to improve discovery in order to help diversify our supply chains. So as part of these national scale assessments, we're evaluating the national scale mineral potential for a number of important mineral systems that contain key commodities that are important for the transition to net zero. As part of this second phase of the Exploring for the Future program, we've evaluated the national scale potential for sediment hosted zinc lead, the results of which were released in March this year, sediment hosted copper and carbonatite related rare earth element mineral systems each of which contain critical and other important minerals that are key for the transition to net zero. So you can see here which commodities occur as the primary commodities in the mineral systems, as well as a number of commodities which occur as by or co-products in these systems. We also note that some of these primary commodities and by and co-products are present in mine waste. Secondary prospectivity from mine waste is being investigated as part of the Exploring for the Future Mine Waste Project, which Jane Thorne spoke about earlier in the showcase. Mineral potential mapping is using the well-established mineral systems-based approach, which integrates mappable criteria representing spatial proxies for the source of the fluids, metals and ligands, energy sources and fluid flow drivers, lithospheric architecture and fluid flow pathways and or depositional gradients. This presentation will focus on the results of the sediment hosted copper and carbonatite related rare earth element mineral potential mapping assessments which have been undertaken recently. So mineral potential mapping involves the integration of large volumes of multidisciplinary geoscience data with decades of combined mineral systems expertise and working out how to translate the mineral systems processes into mappable criteria. The general approach has been to assign weights to the importance, applicability and confidence values, which are measures of how important each map is for the mineral system, how well each map represents the mineral systems process and how, how confident we are in the data quality. These weights then get multiplied together pr to produce an overall map weight for each input map in our model. We can also evaluate the predictive power of individual input maps and data sets, as well as the overall mineral potential maps using different statistical measures. 
We have also been producing data uncertainty maps to go along with each mineral potential map because some of the input maps contain areas of incomplete mapping or information. So these are considered no data areas that we want to be able to assess separately because we don't want to downgrade their prospectivity just because they're missing data. So first off, I'll present the results of the sediment hosted copper mineral potential assessment, which incorporates the sediment hosted stratiform copper and Mount Isa type copper systems. These sediment hosted copper systems are an important global resource for copper, as well as critical minerals such as cobalt, which is currently a key component in battery technologies. They are also the type of copper system that we are wanting to find more of because they are typically high grade, low tonnage deposits. For example, in Poland, sediment hosted stratiform copper deposits in the Cooper Shiva can be very narrow, down to only a few tens of centimetres, and are being mined to depths of over one kilometre. Deposits like these can have a smaller impact on the environment than other types of copper deposits that may be low grade, high tonnage. So although we have reviewed each of the two copper systems separately here, the sediment hosted stratiform copper and Mount Isa type copper, we've combined them into a single mineral potential map due to the number of similarities between the two systems. Here we have a table showing the mineral systems components and the theoretical and mappable criteria used to represent spatial proxies for the physical and chemical processes in the system. You can see on the left that we've split out the sediment hosted stratiform copper and Mount Isa type copper criteria. However, these are integrated into three separate mineral potential maps on the right that use different combinations of the input maps. You will note that model one includes all of the input maps. Model two excludes maps from geological data sets such as the solid geology mapping, which currently has incomplete national coverage. However, we note that this is being progressed and is expected to be delivered in June 2024, as well as the Australian Stratigraphic Units database, which sometimes has an inconsistent level of attribution for querying keywords. So this uh, particular model two ends up containing no maps representing the ore depositional gradients because they're all based on this geological mapping data. And model three only ends up including maps that have complete or near complete national coverage, which means that it only includes maps representing the lithospheric architecture component of the mineral system. I'll be focusing the discussion on the results of model two, which represents a good middle ground between being able to successfully predict the location of known sediment hosted copper deposits and occurrences, as well as incorporating maps that represent three of the four mineral systems components. There are no major surprises in the maps, with elevated prospectivity observed in the Northwest Queensland Minerals Province, as well as in uh, the Stewart Shelf in South Australia. We also see elevated prospectivity in areas with no known sediment hosted copper deposits or occurrences, such as the MacArthur, South Nicholson, Georgina, uh, Officer and Yanina Basins, as well as parts of the Etheridge, and Kernamona province. The map on the right shows the data uncertainty, including where more than 20% of the input maps used to generate the mineral potential map have missing or unknown data values. While this 20% value is arbitrary, it can be used as a guide as to where more caution may want to be taken when evaluating the mineral potential map. As I mentioned earlier, we can use statistics to evaluate the predictive power of our mineral potential maps. This can be done using area under the curve analysis, which looks at the cumulative amount of area required to predict the cumulative number of deposits. Area under the curve values closer to one have a stronger predictive power. Values of 0.5 are essentially equivalent to random chance and values less than 0.5 are worse than random. You can see on the graph here that the area under the curve plot for the three sediment hosted copper models. Model one shows an area under the curve value not much above random chance. And this is interpreted to be due to the higher data uncertainty in the model due to more missing data and unknown values in the input maps over areas where the known deposits and occurrences are located. This was actually what initially triggered the development of models two and three. You can see a rapid increase in the area under the curve value for model two, 
which excludes the maps derived from the geological data sets, with a more marginal improvement seen for Model 3, which only includes maps with complete or near complete data coverage. The points on the graph here are indicative of where the thresholds have been assigned for a potential reduction in the exploration search space. As I mentioned earlier, we have also previously released mineral potential maps for sediment hosted zinc lead mineral systems, such as clastic dominated siliciclastic carbonate, clastic dominated siliciclastic mafic, Mississippi Valley type and Irish type systems. You can see the mineral potential maps on this slide, along with the area under the curve plots, showing the predictive power of each map. Just noting that we couldn't do the area under the curve plot for the Irish type zinc lead system because we didn't have enough known deposits or occurrences. That model was more of a blue sky hypothesis test to see if Australia had the right mineral systems ingredients for the mineral system to form. We've also produced data uncertainty maps to go with each of these mineral potential maps in this study. Moving on, we've also undertaken a mineral potential assessment for carbonatite related rare earth element mineral systems. This is an important mineral system because they contain the majority of known global rare earth element resources and are also an important source of niobium and yttrium. This work leverages off the Australian Alkaline Rocks Atlas that was also developed as part of the Exploring for the Future program. For more about the Atlas, please see the earlier showcase presentation by Eloise Bayer. For the purposes of this study, we've actually constrained the model to the magmatic component of the system and have not considered the rare earth element mineralisation related to weathering processes, which we acknowledge can in itself represent a significant economic resource. The table here shows the mineral systems components and the theoretical and mappable criteria used to represent spatial proxies for the physical and chemical processes in the system. You might note that the model is heavily focused on the use of geophysics to map the source and lithospheric architecture, which are key to the formation of carbonatites and their associated rare earth element mineralisation. Just to note here that we haven't actually aimed to predict the location of individual carbonatites, which are often quite small in scale, but rather we've looked to predict belts where carbonatites and carbonatite related rare earth deposits are more likely to form. As part of this assessment, we've developed a new hybrid data and knowledge driven mineral potential mapping method based on the use of Kolmogorov Smirnov statistical test and a weighted sum approach. This Kolmogorov Smirnov test evaluates the probability that the deposit distribution in relation to the map could be produced by random chance by comparing it to the cumulative distribution function for a set of random locations. Lower probability values indicate that the map being assessed has a higher predictive power for the mineral system being targeted. The probability values are then transformed to the zero to one scale and assigned to the importance value for the map which is then multiplied by the applicability and confidence values, which are still assigned by experts to produce an overall map weight. These statistics can also be used to help guide feature engineering for the input maps and determine any optimal thresholds where we see the maximum difference between the cumulative distribution function for the deposits and that obtained for the random locations. The Python code for evaluating these statistics was recently released on GitHub as a Jupyter notebook and can be downloaded from Geoscience Australia's GitHub repository using the link on the screen. Two carbonatite related rare earth element mineral potential maps have been produced. Model 1 integrates maps representing the source, drivers and architecture components of the mineral system and is explicitly focused on targeting under cover. Model 2 integrates maps for the source drivers architecture and or deposition components of the system. However, we note that this does include surface geochemistry maps to represent the ore deposition component. So this map does have some bias towards official mineralization. Both maps show broadly similar trends. And as you can see, both show highly prospective area away from known carbonatites and carbonatite related rare earth element deposits. We note that neither model shows elevated prospectivity in Eastern Australia, broadly in the Tasmanites. That's not to suggest that there isn't any. However, the statistical methodology used in this assessment skews the higher prospectivity 
towards areas that show similar characteristics to the already identified carbonatites and carbonatite related rare earth deposits. And other, as there are currently none that we have identified in Eastern Australia, this strongly influences the mineral potential mapping result. Using the same area under the curve analysis that was used for the sediment hosted base metal models, we can validate the mineral potential maps. Both models developed for the carbonatite related rare earth mineral system show very high area under the curve values and show a significant reduction in the exploration search space by up to about 90%. There were a number of possible carbonatites that weren't included in either the training or the validation data sets for these models because we didn't have sufficient information available to be sure that they were in fact really carbonatites. However, interestingly, these locations show up in areas of high prospectivity. And we hope that further work on these projects by exploration companies will provide further confirmation of the predictive power of these two models. Again, we can see on the slide the location where the reduction in the areas uh, exploration search space has been assigned. So in summary, the mineral potential maps broadly show prospect, high prospectivity in different regions across Australia for key commodities that are critical for the transition to net zero. We've also produced the first national scale mineral potential map that is focused on carbonatite related rare earth element mineral systems. We've also developed a new hybrid data and knowledge driven methodology for mineral potential mapping with the code available for the statistical analysis now available on GitHub. The mineral potential maps for each of the mineral systems assessed shows elevated prospectivity in areas with no known associated mineralisation and these could represent new exploration search space for industry. And typically, where known mineralisation is associated with weaker prospectivity values, we tend to see higher data uncertainty because there are more missing data values in the input maps in these areas. So where to next? Well, we currently have mineral potential assessments in progress at the national scale for iron oxide, copper gold and high purity quartz. You can see on the image here a previous assessment that was undertaken for iron oxide, copper gold mineral systems in the North Australian Craton, and we're extending this nationally. We will also look at undertaking possible revisions to the models talked about in this study to include updated solar geology mapping in Southern Australia, new Auslamp magnetotellurics models, as well as new Oz array passive seismic models. We could also look at integrating new maps relating to economic fairways and environmental, social and governance mapping. However, we do note that other mineral systems contain these key commodities, and we could also look at modelling the mineral potential for these different systems. So importantly, now what I'm sure everyone has been waiting for, where to get the results and the data. The mineral potential maps can be accessed through the Exploring for the Future Data Discovery Portal. And if you use the QR code on the right, that will take you to a new mineral potential mapping web page on the Exploring for the Future website, which provides links to the different products discussed in this presentation, including the mineral potential maps and corresponding data uncertainty maps, the input maps for the models, and an assessment criteria table that is essentially a workflow document that provides information on how and why the maps were made. So if you don't like our combination of input maps or the weightings that we've assigned, you can make your own. The web page also has links to the Exploring for the Future extended abstracts on the sediment hosted zinc lead and sediment hosted copper mineral potential assessments. A manuscript on the carbonatite related rare earths model is currently in review with all geology reviews and should hopefully be out later in the year as an open access article. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ariane. It's fascinating to see the different components or ingredients that are required to come together for each different mineral system to form. More and more we're seeing explorers act on these mineral potential maps, so it's fantastic to have another two released today. Just a reminder, please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask, and we'll get to these in the Q&A session later. Our next speaker is Tihani Palu, who is joining us from New Zealand and will present on Australia's onshore basin inventories, laying the foundation for Australia's energy future. 
Tihani is a petroleum geoscientist at Geoscience Australia with expertise in petroleum systems analysis, geological modelling and basin analysis. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science and a uh, Master's with honours in 2009 from the University of Waikato, New Zealand. Tihani is currently working on the Exploring for the Future program with the Onshore Energy Systems team at Geoscience Australia. Thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to listen to this update on the Onshore Basin Imagery Project for Energy Resources. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues involved in the Basin Inventories who are listed here and who are all an integral part of the Basin Inventory work. I'd also like to acknowledge the graphics design team at Geoscience Australia who have assisted in making many of the beautiful maps and figures for much of our work and specifically for this presentation and who are often overlooked, so thanks. First of all, I want to outline how I'm going to step you through this presentation with five areas I'd like to cover. The first is, why do we need basin inventories? The why. Secondly, I'll talk about what is included in the basin inventories, which areas we have covered so far and how they are then used. This will thirdly lead to an overview of which basins are currently being worked on. I will then provide some brief examples of new products that have come out as a result of the previous basin inventories. And lastly, I will show you an example of the impacts that one of our basin inventories has had for the Australian economy and for our energy resource future. As we all know, Australia is aiming for a net zero emissions future by 2050. In order to achieve this, we need to utilise gas resources as a transition fuel for Australia's energy security. As my colleague Dr Andrew Feitz covered in his talk earlier, Australia is well placed for geological storage of hydrogen and understanding the nation's geology is key in implementing this emerging energy resource. The basin inventories provide a snapshot on the current knowledge of regional geology for basins that have resource potential to help move towards a more efficient energy future. But what is included in the basin inventories? So these reports provide a whole of basin inventory of their geology, their exploration history and current status, their petroleum systems and the data coverage of the area, for example, the amount of wells drilled and any geophysical or seismic data available across that area. The basin inventories provide a single point of reference and create a standardized national inventory of onshore basins. This map shows which basins have been published, which I will cover more shortly. The purple and yellow basins have been published in the last few years, while the green basins indicated are those that are either recently released or currently being worked on. Each assessment includes pre-competitive information from Geoscience Australia, state and territory governments, and publicly available exploration results and geoscientific literature. A key aspect of the onshore basin inventories are the recommendations for future work that are made based on identified data and knowledge gaps. The baseline understanding of basin architecture, evolution, resource potential and outstanding scientific questions identified by the inventories delivers an ideal base from which to inform the design and acquisition of new pre-competitive data sets as part of the EFTF, as well as for industry and government agencies, which I will show more shortly. Broad classifications of overall basin prospectivity for energy resources are defined by the onshore basin inventory allowing the comparison of basins based not only on their potential to host energy resources, but also the confidence with which that assessment is made, shown on this matrix figure. This assists future program planning for both industry and government. You may ask, why do no current basins fall in the lower left area of the matrix, or conversely, in the upper right? This is because a basin with low prospectivity in the lower left is not very likely to have high confidence which is usually a reflection of the amount of data and knowledge collected for that basin. Conversely, a basin with little data and knowledge, for example, low confidence, will most likely not be ranked as highly prospective until more work has been done in that area. Basins thus far have been selected as part of the basin inventory work where there is some regional scale knowledge with some previous exploration in adjacent areas that might help correlate between them. In the planning phase of the EFTF program, this matrix was used to screen basins and guide the design of work programs in each basin, based on outstanding scientific questions, as well as identified uncertainties and data gaps, to plan for new product and data releases. 
Basins where this assessment has resulted in programme work for new products include the South Nicholson region of northwestern Queensland and the Northern Territory, and the Kidson Sub-Basin of the Canning Basin in Western Australia, and the Officer Basin of South Australia and Western Australia, and I will show some examples of these shortly. So, as I've mentioned, Volume 1 and 2 were released several years ago, and the basins that were included are listed here. You can read those in your own time. The Ada Vale Basin report was released earlier this year, and another report titled Mesoproterozoic Basins of Australia was released in June this year. This report is an extensive overview of the Mesoproterozoic aged basins shown on the map on this slide, providing an essential resource for future work planning. New inventory chapters currently being prepared are the Burundudu Basin and the Carpentaria Basin, both of which will be released this financial year, so stay posted for those. So now I'd like to present you with some examples of new data products that have been delivered in response to many of the data gaps identified at the basin inventories. A project as part of the EFTF was undertaken in the Officer Basin, which included petrophysical and geomechanical studies, reprocessing of legacy industry seismic data, petrography analysis, and the digitization of selected well log data. All this work contributed to developing a new strength chemostratigraphic correlation for the basin, which linked Western Australia and South Australia together. Another example of new products delivered is the acquisition of new regional organic geochemistry data across many basins, but also particularly in the Ada Vale and Eramanga basins, where legacy drill core were resampled and analysed to understand organic richness, thermal maturity and macerol assemblages. This work was undertaken on five drill cores stored in the Geoscience Australia repository. Additionally, Fluid Inclusion Stratigraphy, or FIS, was also undertaken on the same wells. The inventories are further supported by the ongoing development of the nationwide source rock and fluids atlas, accessed through the Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future data delivery portal. The source rock and fluids atlas provides up-to-date information on organic geochemical and geological data from Geoscience Australia's organic geochemistry database, within both onshore and offshore basins, enabling the characterization of petroleum source rocks and the identification of their derived petroleum fluids. Another example of new products is the burial and thermal history modeling recently done in the Ada Vale Basin. Nine 1D burial and thermal history models were constructed across the Ada Vale Basin using existing open file data to access the lateral variation and maturity from potential source rocks in the Ada Vale Basin. This work incorporates the newly acquired Ada Vale Basin Organic Geochemistry work that I just mentioned and was undertaken alongside the associated onshore basin inventory chapter. It informs our understanding of the potential hydrocarbon generation of the region and impacts on other potential resources, such as salt for hydrogen storage. These results so show the model for the Gilmore One well, showing where the sediments reached certain temperatures, how well the data matches with the modelled results, and when hydrocarbons were generated for the source rocks that are present in this location. These types of thermal models are also useful for mineral systems in other locations of Australia. The report for this Aidan Vale modelling project will be available in the coming months. The Data Driven Discoveries Program is another program led by Geoscience Australia in collaboration with the Geological Survey of Queensland and will provide companies and governments with vital information to help secure the region's prosperity and our nation's future, future to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Another EFTF product from our Economic Fairways team uses reservoir properties and transport differences to estimate the overall cost of geological storage of CO2. The model evaluates the cost of CCS projects, accounting for regional variations in transport distance and the cost as well as the storage properties of individual reservoirs for a range of field injection rates. The figure on the left highlights five key prospective CO2 storage locations, considered at an advanced stage of development, with current gas pipeline corridors. The figure on the right highlights those areas, the paler colours, the lighter colours, with predicted lower storage and transport costs based on location, but also CO2 injectivity. This powerful tool can be easily adapted to assess new CO2 storage locations, including those potentially identified through the basin inventories. For more information, please check out the EFTF abstract by Stuart Walsh et al.
Seismic data acquisition and drilling in the South Nicholson and the Kitson Subbasin of the Canning Basin in Western Australia have resulted in significant improved understanding of the regions and have made new data freely available to help us understand the geology, the history and the resource potential of these regions. These campaigns have resulted in many reports being published to help analyse the data collected, including age dating, geochemistry, microfossil analysis, geomechanical analysis, gas analysis, petrography and seal capacity analysis, chemostratigraphy, Rockavel, well lower correlations and petroleum systems modelling and analysis. All these reports and data releases are available for the, from the websites listed here. For the South Nicholson Basin, this work ultimately led to the discovery of the Carrara Subbasin, which has been confirmed as closely analogous to the Lawn Hill Platform in the Isa region, or the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory, which are both resource provinces. And finally, I wanted to show you an example of the impacts that this work has had particularly for the Australian economy and resource exploration. So keeping with the South Nicholson region that I just showed you, the Basin Inventory Volume 1 recommended a range of new data acquisition to help define the stratigraphy, the structure and understand the potential petroleum systems for this region. This included the collection of gravity data, as well as the seismic and drilling campaign that I briefly showed you in the last slide. After the completion of these recommendations, a new subbasin was discovered named the Carrara Subbasin, and ultimately sparked industry interest with Santos taking up and planning a further drilling campaign in new tenements for energy resources, as well as 10 companies with interest in mineral exploration tenements, shown in green and pink on this map. This highlights it to us, although the basin inventories originally targeted the prospectivity of energy resources, much of the information that is presented and collated plus the new data acquisition has had huge implications for mineral exploration for this region also. This shows us that our information is useful for many aspects of Australia's economy. Geoscience Australia is also developing a way to deliver this useful information in a way for all to discover, which was presented by my colleague Dr Catherine Waltenberg yesterday, called GeoWrapper. To summarise, the basin inventory reports provide a current snapshot of the level of knowledge for the basins, and most importantly for us, have identified issues and remaining questions to help answer outstanding science questions within the basins. These recommendations have heavily informed the Exploring for the Future pre-competitive data acquisition program, guiding project design and delivering new fundamental data sets that build understanding and poorly understood regions with significant energy potential. The up-to-date foundational work undertaken in the onshore basin inventories presents a launching pad for which data acquisition can be planned by both industry and government and has contributed to scoping and planning of exploring for the future in other Geoscience Australia programs. As a result, significant new pre-competitive data sets have been acquired in the South Nicholson region and the Canning Basin, significantly enhancing understanding of basin architecture and resource potential and hence attractiveness for exploration, not just for the energy sector, but also in the mineral sector, and we hope in the future, the hydrogen energy sector also. I want to finally acknowledge our state and territory partners in our basin inventory work, as well as other organisations who have contributed to many of our data acquisition programmes. And to end, I'll leave these links to reports, data portals and websites here for anyone to go and take a more in-depth look later. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our future interactions about this work. Thanks for listening. Thank you Tahani. It's great to see the basin inventory expand across the country as Carol said in his talk on Tuesday, positioning us for future studies. It's also great to see the economic fairways approach being expanded to consider CO2 sequestration. Our next speaker in this session is Dr Stephen Lewis, who will present on prioritising regional groundwater assessments based on the National Hydrogeological Inventory, a case study of the Cenozoic Lake Air Basin in Central Australia. Steve is currently employed as a geologist within the groundwater team at Geoscience Australia. Steve started his career as an exploration geologist, working with Ashton Mining to hunt for diamonds and kimberlites across Northern Territory and Northwestern Africa. Following the completion of his PhD at the University of Tasmania, Steve joined Geoscience Australia where he has worked on a variety of multi-jurisdictional geoscience investigations over the past 17 years, including the Paleo Valley Groundwater Project and Bioregional Assessment Program. 
He's currently focused on addressing national scale groundwater challenges as part of the Exploring for the Future program. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for the resource potential session of the Exploring for the Future showcase. Uh, I'm Steve Lewis, and today I'll be providing an update on our work to develop a national hydrogeological inventory and also explaining how we we're able to use the inventory to help identify and prioritise a more detailed investigation looking at the Cenozoic sediments and aquifers of the Katitanda Lake Eyre Basin in Central Australia. Look, I'm really delighted to be delivering this presentation today on behalf of the many people within Geoscience Australia's groundwater team who have helped to drive our progress on national and regional scale groundwater research as part of the Exploring for the Future program. So the Exploring for the Future program has really been a critical enabler for Geoscience Australia's groundwater team to pivot towards tackling national scale hydrogeological challenges. And this is really in line with commitments under our Strategy 2028 framework to help secure Australia's water resources. So you can see here the four Strategy 2028 commitments that are relevant to our groundwater program. And I'd really like to draw your attention to the last two dot points, which focus on delivering a complete map of Australia's groundwater systems, as well as detailed regional groundwater assessments. And as you'll see as I go along today, our groundwater research under Exploring for the Future is really strongly aligned with these commitments, in particular through developing a national hydrogeological inventory and an online mapping application and then using this inventory to help prioritise regional investigations with the example today being for the Katitanda Lake Air Basin in uh, Central Australia. So I'd like to begin by taking us back to the first continent scale map of Australia's groundwater systems. We can see here the hydrogeology of Australia. This was really a groundbreaking piece of national research when first published in 1987 by the Bureau of Mineral Resources. And this is one of Geoscience Australia's predecessor organisations. It was also accompanied by a set of explanatory notes published in BMR Bulletin 227, which you can also see here. So the main feature of this map is the distribution of principal aquifers of Australia, which are here defined as those aquifers that produce the best quality groundwater at the highest yields and from the shallowest depths. Now, at the beginning of Exploring for the Future, we completed a quite thorough review of the map and the explanatory notes, and we identified several limitations which really affect its current application and usefulness. So to start with, the map and notes have not really been revised or updated since they were first published. Since then, we've had quite a lot of, of local to national uh, and regional scale studies right across Australia that have contributed a wealth of new groundwater data and information. Um, but there hasn't really been any process or system in place to get this new information into an updated form of the map. Now, another issue that we recognised is that the existing uh, digital version of the map lacks a lot of useful supporting information. So, for example, even the brief geological and groundwater related descriptions that are in the set of notes about the different parts of Australia have not really been incorporated into this geospatial data set. Um, fortunately, though, our focus on developing a national hydrogeological inventory under Exploring for the Future has provided us with the mechanism to really address some of these fundamental issues. And it also enables us to modernise and enhance the way that we actually deliver the national inventory using the Exploring for the Future, Future data discovery portal. Now, my colleague, Dr. Hashem Carey, introduced the concept of the National Inventory at last year's showcase event. So I won't look to repeat uh, everything that has already been covered, but as background for today, uh, I think it's worthwhile to highlight a couple of important features. So we can see here on this map, um, we've updated a, a National Inventory, dividing the Australian continent into 42 hydrogeological provinces. Uh, now, about 90% of these are the major sedimentary basins uh, of the country, and these are of varying size, obviously shape and distribution, and they contain regional aquifers that range in geological age from the late Proterozoic into the Paleozoic and right through to the Cenozoic. Those intervening regions between the sedimentary basins are grouped into six geographically named fractured rock provinces, which we can see also shown here. 
Uh, and we've also recognised that it's often the case that there are younger aquifer systems which might be developed in alluvium and volcanic rocks, and these can overlie the, the basic um, provinces and basins we show on this map. So we don't neglect those and we actually include them in the particular um, province or, or basin where they actually occur. So the National Inventory and the work we've done presents information across 11 major themes that comprise about 100 different data attributes. So the 11 themes you can see listed here with the pie chart showing the proportion uh, of the different attributes under each of those themes. There's a really strong focus as you'd expect on geology and, and hydrogeology and understanding groundwater systems within these different themes. Uh, and this is supplemented by a range of contextual data, which covers everything from jurisdictional and demographic uh, information through to geography, climate, environment and surface water data. So quite a range of things there that we're including. Uh, for each province, we basically report a combination of curated geospatial data, which has been sourced from a variety of national scale data sets. Now, these include things like Australia's geological provinces, which is really the underpinning data set for most of the 42 provinces uh, in our national inventory. And we also look at things like the National Groundwater Information System, or the NGIS as it's known. Um, others include the Atlas of Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems, as well as a range of other environmental, geographic and climate data sets. Now, we don't just leave it at the geospatial data, we actually en enhance that and provide a targeted summary of scientific uh, and technical literature. So we, we look to sort of see what that new information base has been since the map was first published and summarise that. So this helps to develop a really strong supporting narrative focused on the geology and hydrogeology of each, each province. So I guess the, you know, the overriding message here is that the combination of national geospatial data and descriptive scientific narrative really provides that clear, quite consistent inventory of knowledge about Australia's major hydrogeological provinces. Now, of course, uh, researching, compiling, synthesising and reporting on this treasure trove of, of data and information is really only part of the story. And we've also invested quite heavily in developing an effective means to deliver the inventory via the data discovery portal. Um, this has really the added advantage, I think, of modernising the way that we present the updated hydrogeology of Australia. And it's really been an important part of our, our overall knowledge delivery strategy in the program. So I'm delighted today to be able to share a sneak peek of the National um, Inventory, which is currently under de development within the portal. Um, and this is ahead of its impending release in the very near future. So the portal map view, which you can see here, shows the collection of those 42 hydrogeological provinces. And here they're coloured based on the main geological age uh, of the basin rocks, with those intervening fractured rock areas shown in the, the lighter pinkish brown colour. Now, from this display, you'll be able to select a, a province of interest and then bring up a subset of information from the inventory report. So the example that I have circled on the map here is for the Galilee Basin in central Queensland. And along the side, you can see a snapshot of that summary information that will be presented when you select your uh, province of interest. Uh, of course, you'll also be able to link from this summary uh, to access the complete document style report that we've actually compiled for each of the, uh, the provinces. Now, I think at this point, it's also worth mentioning that developing the national inventory within the portal will be a staged approach for us. So there'll be further design and development work uh, to be done in coming months. So I guess reflecting then a little bit on the national uh, inventory uh, and making it freely available will, we think, benefit a range of people, organisations and groups that have an interest or a particular need for information about Australia's major groundwater systems. And we've listed some of these potential benefits uh, here to just summarise them briefly. And firstly, the national imagery will provide a consistent foundational hydrogeological data set, as well as uh, a range of important groundwater and contextual information. Uh, we think the new online mapping application via the portal will really modernise the way that we can deliver this information and effectively provide that really timely update to the content that was first published as part of the explanatory notes uh, over 35 years ago now. We really um, are looking to the inventory, I, I think, to help facilitate some new groundwater systems understanding, particularly across uh, larger aquifer systems, uh, across jurisdictional uh, boundaries, for example. We think this will really improve research collaborations, uh, science approaches and, and information sharing more generally. Um, and I guess finally, the, the inventory work that we've done here and that's displayed in the portal has really been developed to be quite flexible. So 
We want to uh, allow for further updates and modifications into the future as we receive feedback on the work we've done thus far. So changes, if needed, can be accommodated in future iterations. I guess another really important application and one that we're particularly interested in is using the inventory to help identify and prioritise particular regions of the country where there's a need for more detailed groundwater assessment and research investment. Uh, and to help illustrate this application today, what I'd like to do is take us to the Catty Tanda Lake Air Basin in arid central Australia. So in this part of the world, groundwater systems are really critical for supporting the health of environmental and cultural assets such as wetlands, rivers and springs, as well as the various communities, industries and agricultural developments that, um, that live and thrive in this particular part of the country. Now, when we looked at the information in the national inventory on this part of the world during this preliminary assessment, we recognised that this basin um, was in need of some further, more detailed investigation looking at its hydrogeology and groundwater. And I guess one of the more compelling reasons uh, for this prioritisation was the recognition that although there had been a number of previous studies overlapping geographically with uh, the Lake Air Basin, they hadn't really explicitly focused on assessing the Cenozoic geology or the shallow groundwater system. So they were, they were more interested in looking at some of the deeper geological basins such as the Cooper or the Aramanga Basin. And you can see a list of some of those other studies that we've identified here. In looking through that information um, base, we recognise that there was a substantial amount of, of data and interpretations that exist across the basin. And I guess the important bit is that they were really sort of hidden a little bit in, in a number of disparate studies and that hadn't really been quite focused on the Cenozoic sediments of the lake air itself. So um, we recognise that there was a valuable information base there that we could unify as part of a more dedicated regional assessment, um, which I think provided us with tremendous scope for uh, undertaking this particular work. Early on in this process, we recognised that there was a need to improve that foundational geological knowledge base, particularly looking at the Cenozoic sediments within the basin. So this was doing um, work to better understand the distribution, thickness, and architecture of the sedimentary infill, as well as looking at the nature of geological structures which have influenced deposition. Uh, our work has had a strong focus on the main sedimentary depot centres in the geological Lake Air Basin. And you can see those shown on the map here as the Tarare Subbasin in the central west, the Calabona Subbasin in the southeast, and then the Cooper Creek Pali Valley as well in the central east of the uh, Lake Air region. And it's really these three areas that have the thickest accumulations of sediment and are most likely to host the major uh, aquifer systems in the basin. So through the project that we've been able to undertake, uh, we've integrated and analysed quite a variety of data sets to build up this improved geological understanding. So our work has uh, included consistently defining stratigraphic peaks from petroleum wells, um, stratigraphic holes, groundwater bores, things of that nature. Uh, we've collected and assessed biostratigraphic data, obviously analysed a lot of groundwater bore information and groundwater hydrochemistry data. We've assessed borehole petrophysical data, uh, airborne electromagnetic data as well, including the, uh, the wonderful AusAM regional coverage that you've already heard about as part of the showcase, uh, and also looking at things like surface and subsurface geological mapping. So being uh, able to bring all this together and integrate it has really um, you know, enhanced the work we're able to do for this assessment. So just briefly, I wanted to, uh, I guess, finish up today on focusing on some of the new findings and results from this study. Uh, so our, our new geological modelling has really focused on mapping things like the depth of the Cenozoic sediments and the thickness of those main stratigraphic units of the basin. So these are stratigraphic units like the air and the Namba formation and their equivalents. Um, in the map, we can see here the structure contour mapping for the base of the Cenozoic sediments. Again, looking in that area of the Tarare and Calabona subbasins. Uh, we can also see clearly the Cooper Creek Pali Valley winding from Queensland into South Australia, as well as a range of other geological information, uh, including areas of the outcropping Mesozoic rocks, so they're shown in green here, the underlying Aramanga Basin, and uh, other geological structures. Uh, and I guess the overall work here with the geological modelling component has helped us to identify those areas of major sediment accumulation in the basin, understand its depth and variability, uh, and also assess the influence of those deeper structures. That work has also been supported by um, developing a number of subsurface geological transects, and we have a, a good example here, again from the Tarare subbasin into the Calabona subbasin. So the section here shows the Cenozoic sediments in that upper part within the yellow and, and brown colours, uh, from surface down to depths of around 300 metres and even close to 400 metres in some of those deeper areas. Uh, these overlie the older Mesozoic rocks of the Aramanga Basin, which are here shown in green 
By doing this, uh, this work, we've been able to map out the relative abundance of sands and, and muds within the Cenozoic section and correlate uh, horizons between different wells uh, where that's been possible. Now, these sorts of tools are really useful for um, assessing hydrogeology within the basin as well. So a couple of examples of that, we can see in the, the Terrari subbasin package, generally an overall sandier package of sediments here compared to the Calabona, particularly in that upper part. Um, suggesting, I guess, greater potential for uh, hosting more productive aquifers. Uh, we can also see some of those main uh, geological structural features, particularly the eastern margin of the Terrari subbasin, where it abuts the Gasson Dome in the central part of the image there. Uh, here, we don't have much in the way of Cenozoic sediments, so it's those older uh, Aramanga Basin rocks outcropping. And this suggests to us that there'd be um, very little potential for groundwater flow systems between the two subbasins to be connected. So it's quite likely they're really strongly compartmentalised within those two different subbasins. Reflecting then on that foundational geological study, that's really been critical to enable this more in-depth assessment into the hydrogeology of the basin. And a couple of examples to finish off today. Um, two maps here, the map on the left showing our comprehensive groundwater bore data set with uh, updated attribution of the different aquifers that each bore actually taps into. So this map clearly picks out those main areas where groundwater is actually sourced from the Cenozoic sediments of the Lake Eyre Basin, which you can see in the yellow and orange dots on this map. Uh, with the green dots being uh, bores that are actually tapping deeper aquifers beneath the Cenozoic sediments, and these include things like the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, on the right, we have a new water table trend map, which we think is a first for the area, which has been validated by data from hundreds of different water bores, as well as information from natural springs in the area. And this regional water table map provides uh, an indicative representation of the elevation of the water table, uh, showing the overall groundwater flow direction, being quite uh, similar, I guess, to the, the surface water pattern as well. And that is really from those elevated areas around the basin margins, um, inwards towards the main surface water drainage lines and ultimately towards Katitanda Lake Eyre itself. Uh, maps such as this also help us to identify other features such as groundwater mounding and flow divides. So a really useful tool for a range of hydrogeological purposes. The compilation and analysis of a broad range of hydrogeological information coupled with new maps and models and, and improved groundwater system understanding we think is really going to provide a useful resource for uh, a range of people into the future. It should help um, with planning future groundwater developments, as well as assisting ongoing management and monitoring of uh, the precious groundwater resources that occur within the Lake Air Basin. So bringing me to the end of my presentation for today, I'd really like to finish by reflecting on four summary points that capture the essence of what I've discussed. So firstly, the Exploring for the Future program has really provided the opportunity for Geoscience Australia to pivot towards that greater focus on national scale groundwater challenges. Uh, and this has involved a range of activities. As we've seen today, it's had a really strong focus on a national hydrogeological inventory. And this inventory provides us with a new tool to consistently assess foundational geospatial data and geoscientific knowledge uh, across 42 provinces in the country, which really uh, represent the major building blocks of Australia's hydrogeology. So version one of this tool, as I mentioned, will be publicly released by the uh, portal uh, in the near future. Uh, the inventory also provides us with a really um, strong mechanism to identify and prioritise other provinces for more detailed assessment. And so applying this prioritisation approach has helped us to identify the Cenozoic Lake Air Basin in Central Australia for a more detailed regional assessment under exploring for the future. And as I mentioned before, the results of this uh, detailed work will be published later uh, this year, and we see them benefiting quite a range of groundwater users. So look, thank you very much for your attention today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have been able to present some of the exciting new groundwater research that we've been working on as part of exploring for the future. Uh, if you'd like any further details on the program, then please visit our website and stay tuned for the impending release of the National Hydrogeological Inventory via the portal, as well as the Lake Air Basin products, which are coming in the next few months. So thank you once again, and bye for now. Thank you, Steve, a very insightful talk. It's great to see the basin inventory approach presented by Tahani expanding to groundwater, starting with the rapid inventory and the superb cross-jurisdiction hydrogeology and sequence stratigraphy work on Katitanda Lake Air Basin. I know many natural natural resource management groups are eager for this style of information to be rolled out across the country. 
Our final speaker for this session, and in fact the showcase, is Barry Bradshaw, who will present a case study from the Eastern Central Australian region on assessing the energy resources potential in underexplored regions. Barry is a geoscientist with 32 years of experience undertaking regional geological and geophysical studies and play-based resource assessments for conventional and unconventional hydrocarbon resources, geological storage projects and sediment-hosted mineral deposits in Australia. Barry is currently employed in the Energy Resources and Advice Activity Leader at Geoscience Australia and has previously worked as a Principal Geologist at CGSS Consultants, Senior Research Scientist at uh, Geoscience Australia and our predecessor organisation AGSO, and, the res and a Research Scientist at Texas A&M University. Barry graduated from the University of Sydney in 1988 and completed a PhD in Earth Sciences at the University of Waikato, New, New Zealand in 1991. And I'm reliably assured that there was no overlap between Barry and Tihani's studies. Thank you for that introduction. This afternoon I'll be presenting an overview of the Energy Resource Assessment Module that forms part of our Australia Future Energy Resources or AFA project. In particular I'll be demonstrating how we are utilising and evaluating data in a relatively underexplored area to gain new insights into the regional geology and using these repurposed data sets to gain valuable insights into the energy resource potential of the Eastern Central Australian region. First of all, I'd like to thank the various contributors to the work I'm presenting, including my Geoscience Australia co-authors, our collaborative partners from South Australia, Department of Energy Mining and the NCGS, as well as the various um, contractors that have been engaged to support our resource assessments. The main aim of Geoscience Australia's AFA project is to identify basins that contain potentially favourable mixes of energy resources that can support Australia's transition to net zero emissions by 2050. In particular, the project is helping to understand the full energy resource potential of a series of stacked basins in onshore Australia by assessing potential gas and oil resources geological storage opportunities, and areas with surface resources that may support hydrogen production and storage. So our study is focused on one potential area in eastern central Australia, where there's a series of stacked basins, including the Pre-Permian Warburton Basin, the Permo-Triassic Paderka and Simpson Basins, and the Mesozoic Western Aramanga Basin. These are underexplored and data poor basins um, with only 44 wells drilled to date, about 1,500 kilometres of 2D seismic data, which is predominantly old vintage data acquired in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And to date, there's only been one small oil discovery from Triassic and Jurassic reservoirs at the Pool of Wanna Well, as well as other residual oil discoveries in Blamore 1, Colson 1 and Simpson 1. So we began the energy resource assessment by revisiting the chronostratigraphic framework of the stacked basins in the area. This is an area where there's been a considerable uncertainty in the definition of the basins as shown on the right hand side of the um, screen with South Australia recognising the Paderka and Simpson basins as different basin systems separated by a regional unconformity while in the Northern Territory there's recognitions of a um, single Permo Triassic aged Paderka basin and in the Aramanga basin we also have different definitions with the Aramanga in Queensland defined with basin onset commencing in the um, Upper Triassic. So Geoscience Australia has been able to provide new insights into these basin systems by undertaking integrated well log and seismic interpretations tied back to sequence stratigraphic surfaces that are defined in the Cooper Aramanga Basin. And these studies have also been supported by new palynology analysis under the project. So the studies enabled us to define the main reservoir seal or play intervals that may host subsurface resources, including five regional play intervals in the Permo-Jurassic, highlighted by the purple circles, and nine um, Jurassic-Cretaceous play intervals in the Aramango Basin, highlighted by the blue circles. An early part of our study um, incorporated identifying some of the key data and knowledge gaps that needed to be addressed in order to better understand the energy resource potential of the area. An important part of this process was undertaking what we call post-drill analysis at the previous petroleum wells to understand what were the reasons for the lack of exploration success and what were the geological risks that face explorers. The graph on the right hand side of the screen shows the count of the various post-drill classifications 
um, while the map shows these post-drill results superimposed over a depth structure map at the top of the Namur murter interval. So there are two important clusters of wells on the map. The first are highlighted in blue along the, um, the main structural trend in the area, the Dalhousie MacDills Ridge. Our post-drill analysis highlighted that these wells were all drawn on what we call valid structural traps and likely failed to discover hydrocarbons due to a lack of hydrocarbon charge. This highlighted the, that more work needs to be undertaken to understand where are the source kitchens and what was the timing of hydrocarbon generation and expulsion. The second group of wells shown in yellow extend around the, um, the only known hydrocarbon discovery at Pulawana 1. And these wells were all drilled on what we call low confidence traps based on um, seismic data collected in the 70s and 80s. This highlighted the need to reprocess selected seismic lines to determine if modern seismic processing parameters could give us a significant uplift in seismic data quality to better define structural traps. The data gap analysis also highlighted a um, lack of petrophysics data in the area, which is essential to understand reservoir presence and effectiveness for both hydrocarbon exploration and understanding the geological storage potential of the area. So a major focus for the um, AFA project has been to reprocess key regional seismic lines across the area of interest. And we've undertaken this in three phases. The first two phases of reprocessing in South Australia and Northern Territory were completed and released in 2022. These are the lines that are highlighted in um, yellow and green on the map. The um, final phase of reprocessing of data, which are the lines that are highlighted in red on the map, extends from the West Naramanga Basin further east into the Cooper and Ada Vale. We've just finished reprocessing these data sets and they will be released soon. So the, um, the reprocessed data has shown significant uplift in seismic data quality, enabling us to make more confident interpretations of structures and also more confident subsurface mapping of the sequence stratigraphic surface, surfaces to support our resource assessments. This is an example in the uplift in seismic data quality with um, the reprocess line shown on the right hand side, which has much greater structural and stratigraphic resolution of key stratigraphic intervals for our assessments. The reprocessing has also provided some important new insights into the tectonic stratigraphic evolution of the basins. So this seismic line shows some of the new insights for the stack basin systems that we're gaining from the reprocessed seismic data. First of all, we can now see clear evidence for three basin bounding unconformities. The top pre-Permian unconformity is the oldest and this formed during the Alice Springs orogeny and is a major angular unconformity separating the Warburton Basin below from the Paterga Basin. The second is an unconformity at the base of the Aramanga and that locally truncates the underlying Permian and Triassic strata over structural highs such as the Dalhousie MacDills Ridge. This unconformity formed during the final phases of the Hunter Bowen orogeny. The final unconformity is a major truncation surface at the top of the Aramanga Basin, and this formed during the late Cretaceous Kosciuszko orogeny. So importantly, our integrated well and seismic interpretations are shedding new light on the nature of the Permotrassic basins. This reprocessed line ties to the Blaymore one well on the um, right hand side of the slide. And um, in this well, our new palynology data is indicating that we have a um, lower interval, which is um, uh, upper Permian to lower Triassic age and corresponds to the Wow Candy formation. But the seismic data is showing there's a very distinct upper chaotic seismic unit that we assign to the Pira Pira formation based on our regional interpretations. And importantly, the, the boundary between these two units is a major unconformity highlighted in blue here, which um, truncates out the Wow Candy formation and the upper part of the Perny formation to the northwest on this line. So this is shedding um, new insights into the basin definitions in this area. And it's providing strong evidence that there's a single permanent to Triassic Paderka Basin and that the Aramanga Basin begins with the Upper Triassic Pira Pira Formation as interpreted by the Queensland Geological Survey. This reprocessed seismic line highlights some um, further the magnitude of this Upper Triassic Unconformity with the entire Triassic section and much of the Perny formation eroded out over the crest of the Dalhousie MacDills Ridge. But these sections then fully preserved in the um, footwall block on the um, left-hand side of the slide. 
So our interpretations from the reprocessed seismic data together with um, new petrophysics analysis of wine line logs and our post drill analysis is underpinning our energy resource assessments. I'm showing here some of the early results that were published at the Avia conference in May. The map in the um, top left shows the relative prospectivity for conventional hydrocarbon resources in the Pirapira um, play interval. And these have the highest potential highlighted in green over the Pulawana trough in the central and eastern parts of the assessment area. The map in the um, bottom left shows the relative prospectivity of the Namur, Murta and Adori Westbourne play intervals for our geological storage of carbon dioxide. The results here are indicating that there's medium to high prospectivity over much of the assessment area as highlighted in the yellow and green areas on the map. I'll now take a deeper dive into the CO2 geological storage assessment to highlight how new data analysis and interpretations are providing us insights into the energy resource potential. So our um, resource assessments are made for each of our reservoir seal or play intervals by evaluating a chance of geological success for a series of mappable geological risk elements. The example over on the right shows the risk element layers that we use for CO2 geological storage, and these include injectivity, storage effectiveness, containment, and structural complexity. Each of these risk element map layers are then spatially evaluated using geological maps and a set of criteria to define high, medium, and low chances of geological success. The risk element map layers are then stacked or multiplied through to produce a common risk segment map or heat map that shows areas of relatively high prospectivity in green versus medium and low prospectivity in yellow and red. And this is similar to the spatial analysis approach that's just been shown by Ariane for assessing mineral systems. Our new data sets and interpretations underpin these assessments as shown in these examples from the Adori Westbourne and the Mer Murta storage intervals. Our new seismic interpretations provide the um, depth maps for the regional seals shown on the upper left hand side. And this has allowed us to assess where supercritical conditions for CO2 storage are likely to occur at the top of the storage unit. These are the green areas that are highlighted on the upper right hand side map. The seismic data also allows us to assess where unsuitable conditions may be present due to potentially leaking faults or other migration pathways back to the surface. These are the yellow areas that are shown on the um, bottom right hand side map. New petrophysics analysis of wire log, line log data also enables us to assess where areas are that are likely to have suitable permeability thicknesses of greater than 10 Darcy metres to support industrial scale injection of CO2 at rates of greater than a megaton per annum. These are the green areas that are highlighted on the um, map on the upper right hand side. And as you can see, substantial parts of the area are, are suitable. Electrophasis data from petrophysics analysis also underpins where we have shale intervals greater than 50 metres thick, which could potentially form an effective regional seal for CO2 storage. These are again the green areas shown on the map on the bottom right. And as you can see again, substantial parts of the area have suitable containment for CO2 storage. So we've also begun to use the new data sets and interpretations to build geological models to further understand the resource potential and undertake a more quantitative assessment where it's warranted. In this example, I'm showing on the left hand side, a geological model for permeability thickness in the Namur Murta, Dory Westbourne intervals and the underlying Jurassic reservoirs to understand the scale of geological storage that could be supported in just the eastern part of the potentially prospective area. And this is the area in the right hand side map highlighted by the red polygon. We've recently worked with Risk Advisory to take our deterministic geological model and use their engineering inputs to determine um, the estimated ultimate storage volume in the area. And the results show uh, this could be quite substantial in the order of 16 gigatons of CO2. So there's a potentially significant CO2 storage resource in the area. However, additional work is planned to assess what is the actual accessible geological storage resource particularly through considering existing groundwater resources and environmentally sensitive areas. So in summary, the um, AFA project is demonstrating how reprocessing and analyzing existing data can be used to support robust uh, play-based assessment of energy resources, as well as gaining valuable new insights into the geological evolution of the Eastern Central Australian region. 
Preliminary results are indicating potential for very high prospectivity for geological storage in the Western Naramanga Basin, as well as some prospectivity for conventional liquid prone hydrocarbon resources in the Pulawana Trough. Um, our hydrogen resource assessment is still to occur and this will be supported later in the year by a hydrogeological study, which will also help to understand the impacts of future CCS projects on groundwater resources. Uh, finally, for more information on the energy resource assessment work to date, um, this is available in the extended abstract by Tom Bernicke and others in the EFTS showcase publication. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for the presentation, which looks at the stratigraphy below Caddy Tandar, the Lake Air Basin Steve talked, also talked about. I was really struck by the new insights about basin prospectivity you and the team have been able to extract from reinterpreting, reanalyzing, and reprocessing legacy data. The reprocessed seismic data in particular was very impressive. So this now brings us to the Q&A uh, question and answer session. Our presenters are here in the studio with me uh, and Tahani is, um, in, in Tahani's case, joining online from New Zealand, are ready to answer your questions on their talks. Just a reminder to please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. So the first question is for Ariane from Richard Scott. Could you comment on the approach to get confidence weightings? Uh, thanks for the question, Richard. Um, so the confidence weightings have been assigned subjectively, but have used uh, some certainty definitions uh, that have been previously published by Meyer and Brooker. And so we've come together as a team to assess the confidence in the data quality in terms of the resolution of the data, uh, its location accuracy and the uh, accuracy of any um, attribute information for the source data set and made an assessment of how confident we are in the data quality using uh, those Meyer and Brooker uh, definitions as guidelines. Great, thanks Ariane. A uh, question from uh, Tahani next up, from Ladina Carr. Would you like to comment on how the older inventory volumes are helpful to more recent net zero approach? Um, yep, um, so the, I guess it, the older and the new um, basin inventories, they all provide that fundamental data set. Um, so they provide things, they provide us that knowledge on the stratigraphy, the uh, information on porosity, permeability, all, all important things. The geochemistry of the sediments, these are all important things that we need to understand for carbon capture and storage um, and, and any other low emissions um, uh, geologically based uh, resources that we're looking at. So that's really provides that foundational um, baseline data set or baseline information that we need to know geologically um, for any basin that we're looking at. So that's how any basin inventory really um, provides that information. Thanks, Tahani. I think that sort of touches on the fact that pre-competitive geoscience as a whole is really about that foundational information that, that brings information together that we can use for a range of um, different applications, whether that's for, for net zero or others. So thanks for the answer. Um, next question is for Steve from Anna Pets. Um, Anna says, wonderful talks, everyone. Uh, do you think the hydrogeological inventory would have space availability to include the national hydrogeochemistry data, which currently sits with the Bureau of Meteorology and Water Connect? Yeah, sure. So thank you, Anna, for that question. And uh, yeah, thanks for the compliment as well. So certainly the national um, hydrogeological inventory, it really has been designed to be something that can be flexible and accommodate new information and, and new data to go into it. Um, so in version one, we haven't linked to the National Hydrogeochemical Dataset, but that's certainly something that uh, I think we're planning to do later on down the track. But I would say that we have actually made use of some fundamental, um, I guess, statistical evaluation of how many uh, bores within each of our different provinces we've assessed, how many of those actually do have uh, things like major um, iron chemistry data available. So there is that, um, that sort of information provided at the outset to paint the picture, I guess, about uh, exactly the distribution of um, yeah, that sort of hydrochemistry data um, in groundwater. Uh, and I think uh, subsequent updates can look at doing that linking to not just that particular data set that Anna's mentioned, but certainly others that might also be useful. So I think there's great scope to be able to, to look at doing that in the future. 
Thanks, mm. Steve. And we have quite a strong relationship with the Bureau of the Me Meteorology where we're partnering with them in, in other areas. Did yeah. you want to mention that at all? Yeah, no, look, that's a really good point because um, it's been a particular focus under Exploring for the Future that we have sought to, I guess, enhance our collaboration with other national agencies that do play a really important role within, uh, within the groundwater space right across Australia. And the Bureau of Meteorology is certainly a really important organisation that, that does that. And so we're actively collaborating with them on a number of different aspects of work that we do, things like, uh, a good example, an update to the National Aquifer Framework, for example. So we're, we're looking at, I guess, improving some of the, the information that goes into that, that comes um, you know, initially from Geoscience Australia, particularly our Australian Stratigraphic Units database. Uh, and looking to actually bring that in and, you know, I guess, uplift some of the information there. So really important aspects uh, of that you know, collaboration, which I think I alluded to in my talk as well. It's uh, you know, a, a fundamental thing that we're striving towards within uh, our broader groundwater program within Geoscience Australia and certainly um, yeah, collaborating with the Bureau and certainly a broader range of other research organisations is really important. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something that we'll look to continue to uh, yeah, do further into the future. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, a question for Barry and also Steve, um, but I might go to Barry first, from Richard Blewett. Are the reprocessed seismic lines and the interpretation of these data being integrated with the groundwater inventory at least where projects overlap spatially? So, over to you, Barry, first. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, the answer is yes, they are. Um, we've been working collaboratively with the groundwater team for several years, um, with, particularly with Nadesh Role. Um, and, um, yeah, we've been fully integrating all the interpretations and the second phase of seismic reprocessing that um, I showed in my presentation, that was actually done in collaboration with the groundwater team to make sure that we were getting um, surveys that would actually help answer some key questions for the um, groundwater inventory team. So, yeah, it, it's been very much a um, integrated collaborative piece of work that we've done with the two teams. Yeah, exactly, Barry. And I think one of the real highlights of exploring for the future has been that opportunity to, you know, look a bit more broadly outside our own discipline areas and see where those commonalities um, overlap, you know, with the, with the geology that we're all focused on, um, building up that fundamental understanding of the framework. And so, yeah, definitely support what Barry said there mm -hmm. around that overlap. Yeah. Really and Aaron, I might go to you as well, whether you think, can see examples where um, that integration across disciplines is also happening in your area? Yeah. Absolutely. So, as uh, particularly with regards to the sediment-hosted base metal mineral potential mapping work that we've been doing, we've been working uh, with different uh, branches across Geoscience Australia to get their understanding of the uh, sedimentary provinces in Australia and integrate knowledge about uh, petroleum system, the presence of petroleum systems as an example as being really important for some of these systems. So, getting that understanding from across uh, the energy systems and also getting an understanding of groundwater chemistry can also help feed into these assessments. Yeah. So definitely working across the different uh, disciplines. Great, thank you. Just uh, on to another question for um, Barry from Anita Dweig. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Barry, what does your work mean for the definition of the Simpson Basin? Hmm, that sounds like a big yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know Anita quite well. Thanks, Anita. Um, yeah, what it means, Anita, I think, from what I showed from the um, seismic interpretations is the, that there, I, I don't see there's a, a need to have a separate Simpson Basin, that you can define the Paderka Basin as including the Permian, and then that um, the lower part of the um, to middle Triassic in the Whale Candy Formation, but clearly there's a major angular unconformity occurring between the Whale Candy Formation and the, um, the Pira Pira Formation. And that's an unconformity we see right across Australia. Um, if you're in Western Australia, Northern Territory, it's, it's the Fitzroy movement. Um, in Eastern Australia, it's the Hunter, um, Bowen Orogeny. So mm -hmm. it's a major basin bounding unconformity. Um, you see it up in the, um, in the north, in the Arafura Basin, Money Shoal. It's the same thing there. So the main thing that I need, or I would say, is that previously um, the, the Northern Territory definition of the Paderka Basin included the Pira Pira, went right up to the top of Triassic. But what I'm seeing is more consistent with what the Queensland Geological Survey has been saying for over 20 years, which is that the Aramanga actually began in the upper part of the Triassic and that the Pira Pira, um, which is the equivalent of the Cutter Pen over in Queensland, is actually the beginning of the Aramanga Basin. 
And I think that's the benefit of having a, a national approach to these sort of things, where it can be cross-jurisdictional and you're bringing information across from the different jurisdictions to understand a system as a whole, where they're moving away from those sort of um, boundary-related challenges that we've seen in the past. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Okay. Um, then on to Barry again, or Steve. Maybe we'll start with Steve this time. Uh, again from Anita. Will the new seismic interpretation of the Baderka and Eramanga basins be incorporated into the Great Artesian Basin 3D model? Oh, that's a good question. So <clears throat> we have spent a lot of work uh, in a, a related project looking at the Great Artesian Basin uh, in a lot more detail over the last few years. And I'd encourage everyone with an interest uh, in the Great Artesian Basin, both the Eramanga and more broadly, to uh, yeah, check out that information source uh, on the Geoscience Australia website because there's a, yeah, a really great um, treasure trove of information on the, the GAB there. Uh, and I guess, um, so we've looked under exploring for the future to actually then, I guess, extend our work in the Great Artesian Basin and, and you know, go to other, other basins more broadly. And I guess, Barry, that's probably where some of that overlap comes in with, uh, with work that you're doing as well, um, potentially on the Paderka. Um, and I guess, yeah, more broadly into other areas um, as well. So we're looking at, you know, extending, I guess, towards the west and, and some of those Centralian super basin basins that are there and then into the north as well, and potentially right across to, uh, to WA eventually, so that we're looking at building up this greater, um, you know, from the point of view of groundwater, greater hydrostratigraphic framework for the nation. Um, and I guess, Barry, if you've got anything to add on to that in particular. Yeah, yeah. So, Anita, um, we are releasing all the seismic interpretations that have been made um, as part of the study. Some of it has actually already been released with a, um, a combined um, uh, product between us and Groundwater, um, which I think has just become available fairly recently. Um, so that one will include our interpretation of the, um, the top of the pre-Permian. But I've just finished um, the next product that we're going to release, um, which is going to include all the other horizons that we've interpreted, um, at least for the reprocessed seismic data. So that will all become available, Anita. Uh, it'll just have to go through the usual internal um, review and vetting process, but should be available within a few months, hopefully. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about reprocessing seismic, um, does all is all the legacy reprocessed seismic? reasonable to be, be re, well, the legacy process, legacy seismic, reasonable to be reprocessed? Because you're getting some really um, amazing results out of the stuff that's been reprocessed. Is, is, is all of legacy data okay or, or are there some challenges with some of that? Well, the main challenge you get is that not all the legacy seismic data is actually available anymore. Mm. Uh, a lot of it has been lost, unfortunately. Um, and in our study, we would have loved to have had some of the old regional seismic mines that were shot through the Northern Territory, they just would have been invaluable. But as hard as we tried, we just couldn't find those anywhere that you could access and, and reprocess them. But basically, I think at the, at the end of the day, it's reprocess whatever you can, because a lot of these data sets were acquired 20, 30, 40 years ago mm -hmm. in areas where you're probably not going to be able to access again. So they are a, um, a precious legacy resource that you want to make the most of, you know. So. Uh, wherever you can reprocess, certainly, um, like I said, the main limitation is just being able to access the actual field data and tapes mm -hmm. that you need to do the reprocessing. Um, the only thing you don't really want to reprocess is data that's been acquired and processed in the last 10 or so years because you're not going to get a lot of uplift out of that. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing I would probably exclude. <laughs> Yeah. Great. I think that speaks to the value of data custodianship and stewardship as well, that um, if you can acquire once and use many times, what we're acquiring now can be useful for something different or even more um, tech, new technology that enables us to see even better in another 20, 50 years' time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> ah, another question for Barry. Uh, uh, Someone asked Tahani a question. Um, so a question for Barry from uh, Richard Blewett. Um, what states or territories currently have enacted legislation for exploring for CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage? Um, without that authority, no one can take up the exploration licenses for this play. Yeah, thanks, Richard. That one, unfortunately, I think is one I have to take on notice. Um, certainly aware that Queensland has had that legislation in place for a long time. Um, not sure about South Australia um, and Northern Territory, I think, is working on it, but it's probably better, Richard, to, to actually follow that one up um, by talking to our, our state and territory colleagues and seeing where they're at. Yeah. Okay, great. Does anybody else on the panel know for sure? No? Great. No, I think, as Barry said, you know, we're aware that Queensland does, but yeah, mm. more broadly than that, I think, let's look, look that one up. We'll take that one on notice. Thanks, Richard. 
Great, question for Tahani. Um, so it, it was exciting to see um, the levelised costs for uh, CO2 transport and storage estimates across Australia. Uh, can I ask you to put these numbers in uh, some context for us? What, costs, what cost of CO2 storage is deemed economic? And how much of Australia does that cover? And where are the economic areas around Australia with respect to likely ongoing CO2 to emitting sites? Okay, that's, um, that's a pretty big question, <laughs> um, but I'll do my best to answer that. Um, overall, the answer would be as low as possible. We want that cost to be as low as possible. Uh, but to put some context into that map that I showed, um, can you hear me? Yep, great. Um, to put some context to that map that I showed, the goal would be about $20 per tonne um, of CO2. So that would be for transport and storage within a 100 kilometre distance of a storage site. Um, so that's the current rule of thumb for economic viability um, and to make it competitive for other low emission technologies as well. Um, to answer the second part of the question, um, the 1.7 um, million tonnes per annum Mumba uh, carbon capture and storage plant in South Australia um, is due to be operational next year, I believe. Um, and that has a target life cycle cost of about um, 24 US dollars per tonne. Um, and so that includes transport and storage, but that's noting that they already separate the CO2 as part of their production process. Um, so they don't need those long pipelines as well. Um, so being close to a CO, C, uh, carbon capture and storage hub is key to reducing those costs, um, which that, mount, that, that play fairways map um, really helps um, find those locations. So um, examples would be Momba, for example, and the Surat Basin in, in, in the east. So I hope that answers the question. If you want more information on that, um, give us an email at that email address. Uh, a question for Ariane. Um, this one's actually from me. Um, you mentioned your model doesn't include the geological mapping data, but there's plans to include it once it's, it's released. Um, do you have an idea of how um, the inclusion of that data will impact data uncertainty and some of those other um, analysis that you, you looked at, the um, area under the curve, potential reduction in, in search space, et cetera? Yeah, so we will expect the data uncertainty, particularly in southern Australia, where uh, we haven't used the um, solid geology at the moment, we would expect the data uncertainty in southern Australia to decrease significantly. Um, the area under the curve, um, I think it, that kind of depends on which mineral system we're trying to target. So, for example, a lot of the lead zinc deposits that we looked at are in northern Australia, and that's where we have existing solid geology mapping. So the area under the curve for those particular models is pretty good um, because the solid geology is accurately helping to predict those deposits. Whereas, for example, with the sediment-hosted copper systems, a lot of those deposits are in uh, southern Australia, for example, in the Stewart Shelf, where we didn't have solid geology mapping available in that area um, to help support the prediction of those deposits. So um, I think that it will impact the area under the curve um, because I think it will do better at predicting the mineral systems in southern Australia. Um, it, relating to reduction in the exploration search space, I think it will improve um, due to the improved area under the curve statistics and the distribution of the high mineral potential. Um, that's uncertain, to this, uncertain at this point because while some of the um, unknown geology might come out as being good in the new solid geology map, some of it might be unfavourable. So some areas are going to increase their prospectivity and some are going to decrease their prospectivity. So uh, what happens to that high mineral potential? I think in northern Australia it will probably largely stay the same, but in southern Australia some areas will improve and some will probably decrease a little bit. Yeah, well, I really look forward to seeing it come out with the new yeah. results. Yeah, so. we're looking forward to seeing it too. Stay tuned. Great, yeah. thank you. Steve. 
Uh, what opportunities does Geoscience Australia's national approach to groundwater systems um, understanding provide? And how does this national approach um, complement GA's regional systems analysis and also the yep. jurisdiction's kind of local approach as well? Yeah, okay. So that's, that's a really good question and something that uh, I guess we have given some, some thought to. So in terms of opportunities um, at that national scale, I think one of the, the key things that um, comes to my mind anyway, and I guess I did allude to this in the presentation I gave, was just that opportunity to enhance um, collaboration right across the country. So to, you know, uh, bring in um, different jurisdictions that might actually, um, you know, look after managing different parts of a larger groundwater system, for example, something like, in my example, the Lake Eyre Basin or the, the Great Artesian Basin, as we've, we've already talked about, which are large, you know, multi-jurisdictional major aquifer systems. And so there's a real opportunity, I think, by having this, this national approach um, with Geoscience Australia sort of being involved in there to bring in uh, you know, a number of different um, groups and organisations, people with an interest perhaps in a smaller part of the country and provide some, I guess, overarching um, guidance, assistance, uh, coordination, um, you know, the value of the, the different science capabilities that Geoscience Australia can provide and to actually use that to help address specific um, problems that uh, you know, individual jurisdictions, for example, or individual research organisations might be grappling with. And so I think uh, that's a, a really great opportunity that Geoscience Australia can play in this, this broader national space of uh, a, you know, a broader understanding of Australia's groundwater systems. And I guess the second part of your question and following on to that, how is that complementing, uh, I guess, the long history that, that we have had here at Geoscience Australia working on more, I guess, regional scale groundwater problems. I guess there are a number of aspects to, uh, to that particular part. And I guess fundamentally one of the important things is providing that consistent um, sort of national, uh, you know, both data set and, and information base. So no matter where we go in the country, we'll have a, a really strong um, you know, understanding by delving into something like the national inventory and pulling up a, a range of different um, data and information, which is usually the, the starting point for many a, a regional scale project, but we'll have already done a lot of that groundwork to actually save uh, you know, future people working in a certain area um, the need to go and do that again. So it's a really good uh, compendium of information, I guess, that not just touches on the geology and, and the groundwater systems and a broader hydrogeological context, but also tries to bring in some of the, uh, the important economic or social and environmental considerations, which are really fundamental aspects, I guess, that often drive a, a groundwater investigation. So that, that's a really important part. Uh, I guess another aspect of it is that, um, you know, by looking nationally, we get the chance to work in a number of different hydrogeological environments across the country. And so we can bring in a range of different tools and approaches and, and methods and just understand what's, uh, I guess, what approaches are best suited to different sorts of groundwater systems. And so if we then go and work in another part of the country, we can fall back upon that understanding that we've already de de uh, developed through that, that history, I guess, of working nationally. Um, and, a, and a final point just to mention on it as well, and something I didn't get the chance to talk about in my presentation, but as part of our broader, uh, I guess, approach to investigating groundwater systems under exploring for the future, we have had a strong emphasis on things like, uh, like national guidelines and standards and things like that, and being involved in different groups and, and committees, uh, such as the Water Monitoring Standardisation um, Technical Committee. So they're doing some work at the moment on looking at updating the groundwater content in the, uh, the national hydrometric <coughs> monitoring guidelines. So I think being involved in some of that work, that fundamental work on guidelines and, and um, you know, system understanding, then helps you uh, more at the local scale as well by just uh, having confidence, I guess, in you know, particular appro approaches to apply that uh, you, know, you can fall back upon and know that it's underpinned by uh, a lot of good work that's already gone on in the past. So, yeah, yeah I think Great. there's a number of aspects there that Wonderful. speak to why it's a, a useful thing for us to be involved in. Thanks, Steve. Mm. Exciting. Uh, for Barry, on Tuesday, Andrew Heap showed that <coughs> globally, <coughs> excuse me, to net zero, we will need to sequester a lot more CO2. He showed that the Namua, Mata and, thank you, and, and Dory West <laughs> intervals have highly prospective for CO2 storage. Can you estimate what volume of CO2 could be stored in these intervals? Um, yes, um, that was actually, uh, it was an example of that. Um, at the end of my talk, um, I can't remember exactly what the number was. That was, for ju the, I'll, I'll just step back a bit. The potential geological storage area um, in the Western Era Manga on a purely um, probability of geological success basis is enormous. I mean, 
Um, you could stick a lot of CO2 in there theoretically. Um, and we did actually work with risk um, advisory to actually do some quantification of that. Um, and I, I showed the example of one of those results in the presentation. I can't remember what it was, but it was in the gigaton range. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of storage capacity. Um, to put it into a bit more context, they also looked at the footprint of a single 50 megaton storage site. Now, 50 megatons would pretty much capture all your future emissions mm -hmm. from um, scope one emissions in the Cooper Basin. That would just require an area of about 65 square kilometres. <laughs> so you can capture a lot of CO2 here. Yeah, yeah. But the real question is, what's, what's the impact? You know, and that's the next stage of our study, particularly because we are looking at the storage in the Great Artesian Basin. So that's the next part of our study, is to look at what are the um, unallocated groundwater resources in the area, and particularly what's the water quality. That's a big gap in this area. There's not a lot of information on water quality. So the next part of our work is actually going to be doing petrophysical analysis to um, determine what the um, relative salinity is um, in the wells in the area. So the, we've got a better understanding of, are we injecting into saline aquifers or is it a freshwater aquifer? You know, Because that's gonna be probably the biggest constraint along with sensitivity in the you know surface environment. So, yeah. And we are planning at the um, end of the groundwater study to go back and redo that quantification and then see what is the storage um, um, volumes in the accessible, you know, resource rather than the entire, you know, area that's got high geological, you know, probability of success. So, yeah, yeah. Understanding groundwater seems to be key to so many of the different <coughs> resources we're looking to to um, develop. You know, hydrogen, whether it's um, CCS. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, Steve, if you want to sort of comment on how. Um, maybe we've changed from looking at, at maybe the, the groundwater um, environmental considerations to how, obviously we're still looking at those sorts of things, but how we're now starting to try and understand groundwater in the context of some of these other um, you know, competing use challenges. Yeah, well, it's, well I mean, um, I think this whole session has really just sort of underpinned how many common threads and links there are that we've seen exploring for the future be able to actually bring out and, uh, you know, enhance these opportunities that, you know, the team that I work with get to work with, with people in Barry's team, for example, and see how that sort of all works together. So, I mean, those sorts of, um, those understandings are really fundamental to what we need to do to just get that better, uh, you know, just basic geological information in place so that we can, you know, address questions like Barry said um, that are going to be really important for things like, you know, carbon capture and storage in the future and, and uh, that sort of aspect. So, you know, I think, uh, as you said, Laura, um, yeah, the importance of understanding um, Australia's hydrogeology and groundwater systems sort of has really come to the, the fore in this particular session, which is great from, from our point of view. And, uh, yeah, a lot of work still to be done, but I think, yeah, we've progressed um, quite well, uh, yeah, along the journey as part of the, the work we've done under this program. So I think there's a lot more scope there as well, but um, certainly some strong foundations to, to build upon. So, Thanks, Steve. Hmm. We'll have to draw the Q&A session to a close there. Thank you, Ariane, Barry, Tahani and Steve. And thank you, everyone, who's attended to say today's session. If you'd like to um, ask any questions uh, or make contact, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. This is the final session of the 2023 Exploring for the Future Showcase. I'd like to thank the presenters throughout the three days, our guests and the team behind the scenes that have made it all happen. All the talks and new products released over the showcase can be accessed through our showcase website page, ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. If you'd like to stay up to date on the program, remember to subscribe to our monthly newsletter for all the latest news and releases. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the showcase and we look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs>